Well, let me take a moment to welcome you to North Star. Very excited that you're here today. Uh, also want to welcome all of our other campuses as well as those who are joining us online. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today here at North Star. And uh, we are excited that you have uh, chosen to worship with us and to be a part. You know, we finished up a series a couple of weeks ago uh, entitled um, Mission for Life, talking about life on mission with God, being on mission with God. And it was such a powerful series. So many of you had told me how God had used it powerfully in your life. And so I just sort of uh, had an idea where I was going to go and then decided maybe to do something different uh, because uh, we're in a season where I really feel like God is doing some very unique things, not only in the life of our church, but also in the life of each and every person who attends here at North Star. And so I get questions throughout, you know, the year. People will ask me, hey, pastor, how are things go in our campuses? How are, things, how are we doing as a church? And guys, I got to tell you, you know, in the season um, that we've been in, a lot of people were concerned. You know, they were like, hey, attendance is down. You know, not, not just at North Star, every church. Every, every church attendance is down. Let me tell you some good news. I want to just tell you this because I think this is important. We exceeded our budget this year by $200,000. We have $2 million in the bank. That's not any money to do with anything as far as insurance and FEMA and stuff like that. God has blessed us tremendously as a church, and we are doing great. I mean, it's incredible. In fact, one of the things that we've been doing is praying and asking God what he wants us to do in this next season of ministry, and specifically with the money that he's entrusted us with. Uh, because we believe uh, that as a church, we're not here uh, to hoard what God has given us, but we are here to give it freely, to use it, uh, to do ministry, uh, to touch lives, and to uh, minister to people. And so over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to be in this series uh, where we're talking about uh, you were made for this. And we're going to be talking about vision. We're going to be talking about future because one of the things this last series helped me to understand is that many of us were in a funk, so to speak, right? And, and where you weren't thinking about the future and we weren't looking towards the future. And if I, if I learned anything in that series, it's that so many of you needed to be refocused. And in this next series, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to talk about you were made for this, the vision that God has for you personally and your life and for what he wants you to accomplish and he wants you to do. Now, that's way more individualistic about your life. And what I want for you more than anything else as we begin this series is to clarify God's vision for the future. And so I'm not going to be teaching over the next four weeks. The directional leadership team, along with uh, our board of directors, has asked me to really focus over the next four or five weeks on the series that's coming after this series entitled Rediscovering the Heart of North Star, where I'm going to be sharing the vision for the future and talking about very specifically what we believe God is leading us to do. And so I want to challenge you not only to be here and to be a part. I'll be here every Sunday. I'm just not going to be teaching every Sunday. Roy and Lee have uh, kind of come alongside me and said, hey, we'll help with that. We really want you to pray, to seek God, to hear God's voice. So that in this next season, as you begin to share vision, you can be clear about where it is that God's leading us and what God wants to do. And so vision is a huge part of who we are, not only as a church, but vision is a huge part of who you are as an individual. Without vision, uh, you can't know where to go with your life, and you don't know what to do with your life. In fact, I love what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Acts as he stood in front of King Agrippa. I don't have this on the screen. I'm just going to share this with you in Acts chapter 26, verse 19. He said, I have not been disobedient to the vision that God has given me. In the message paraphrase, he said, what else could I do, King Grippa? I couldn't just walk away from the vision like that, so I obeyed it. What Paul was saying was, I've been obedient to the vision that God has given me. I've been obedient to the vision that God has showed me for my life. Now, what I want to do today and what I want to do over these next few weeks is as your pastor, because I love you deeply, I want to help you particularly as you begin to look to the future to understand God's vision for your life. To know that, that when you stand before God and you give an account for your life, you can say to God, God, I have been faithful to the vision that you have given me. Because that's important. It's, it's an important part of your life. It's an important part of my life. That is exactly why Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Now, what does that mean, the people will perish? 
The idea there is that vision is what allows us to be able to move forward. We can't move forward without vision for our life. And it's not just something that you make up, right? It's, it's God's vision for your life. There's a big difference. And a lot of people try to make up their own vision and do their own thing apart from God. But we can't do that because what it says is where there is no vision, the people will perish. Now, there are three things that I think are important to understand here. Because if you don't have vision for your life, uh, this is what happens. An unclear vision does these three things in your life. And you can write them down if you have your notes. I know many of you are taking them on your phone. Uh, if you want to follow along today, we're going to be in Numbers. We're going to look at a very specific passage of Scripture. But to open, I want to talk about these three things that happen when you don't have vision for your life. The first one is just simply this. An unclear vision leads to indecision. It leads to indecision. Now, this is important because uh, James chapter 1, verse 8, it'll be here on the screen. I want you to listen to what it says. It says, double-minded people can't make up their minds. They waver back and forth in everything that they do. You see, when you don't have a vision for your life, God's vision for your life, you're going to waver back and forth. You're going to be in and you're going to be out. You're not going to be clear about what it is that you need to do. You will drift and you will wander and you will not have clear direction on what it is that you need to do. In fact, I believe this. When you don't have vision, you waste time. When you don't have vision, uh, you miss um, opportunities in your life to be able to accomplish things that God specifically is calling you to as an individual. So the first thing we see, and notice this, the second thing we see is this. An unclear vision leads to division. It leads to division. You don't believe that? Well, let me just tell you something. Look in our world today and you can see that there are all kinds of division. There's different directions. There's different ways. And that often is because the vision is unclear. People don't know where they're going or what they're going to accomplish. And you see, it's important to understand that to be, to be divided on things, if you're not sure where you're headed, guess what? Nobody's going to go with you, right? Even in marriage, there can be division uh, in your home because there's no vision for the future. Uh, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're trying to accomplish. There's no vision about your finances. There's no vision about your relationship. There's no vision about your family. And so what begins to happen is there begins to be a division, right? In fact, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 2, listen to how it says this. It says, when a country is in chaos, everybody has a plan to fix it, right? And look at our country today. Everybody's got a plan, right? But there's nobody with vision. And that's not being critical. Just listen to me for a second. That is the job of a leader. It's to create a compelling vision where everybody knows where we're going. But if it takes a leader of real understanding to straighten things out, that's the Bible. It says it takes a leader with understanding, a leader with vision to be able to do what? To be able to help us uh, see where we're going. And when there's not clear vision, guess what happens? There becomes division. Division in a church, division in a home, division in the community, division with the country. And then thirdly, the third thing that happens is this. When there is no clear vision, it leads to collision. Collision. Now, what do I mean by that? That is, you've probably seen people like this in your life. They're colliding into everything, right? Kind of like bumper cars. Any of y'all remember those? You know, you, get, you go to the bumper cars and you're driving around and people are just running into you. And there's collision, right? And that's what happens when you don't have vision. You're just colliding. You're colliding. You're crashing into all kinds of things. There's collision in relationship. There's collision in confrontation. There's collision in financial um, cra crashes. There's personal crisis. All of those things begin to take place when there is no vision. In fact, uh, in 1 Timothy, it says it this way. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. It says, some have refused to let their faith guide their consciousness, and their faith has been destroyed like a wrecked ship. The point that he's making here is that without vision, there is a, a wreck, right? Like a shipwreck. There's something that happens. There's collision that begins to take place. It requires faith. It requires prayer. It requires seeking God to know what the vision is for your life. And over this past year, our directional leadership team has been doing that. We've been putting in the hard work and asking God, God, what is the vision for the future? It requires faith. It requires thinking. It requires prayer. It requires seeking and listening to God and knowing what God wants for your life. And that's specifically what I want for each and every one of you. And that's where most people don't sit down 
and take the time to really understand God's vision for their life. They're just kind of going through life, colliding into all kinds of things, drifting from here and there, never really understanding what it is that God has called them to. And as a result, they can't see clearly with eyes of faith. It's looking to the future and knowing what the future holds because only God can reveal the future, right? None of us know what the future holds. God knows what the future holds. Uh, he tells us what the future looks like, and we have to listen to him. We have to listen to what he says. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, Jesus talked about it this way. He says, your eyes are the lamp of your body. If your eyes are open and good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your vision is bad, your whole life will be full of darkness. So he's saying spiritually, if your eyes are open, it gives light to your life. It helps you to understand the direction that you should take. And he goes on and he says, if the light that you think you have is really darkness, it's the worst kind of darkness you can have. You see, what I want for you more than anything else is for you to have God's vision for your life. For you to know what it is that God's calling you to do. And I think it's important as we talk about this to understand something. You see, you've heard the phrase before, what you see is what you get. And can I tell you something that's true? Because if you can't see it, you're not going to get it. Let, let me explain what I mean by that. See, there's a big difference between vision and dreams. A lot of people are dreamers. They get a lot of ideas up here in their head, right? They dream about a lot of things. I'm a dreamer. I, I love to dream about things. But one of the things that I learned as a young man is that a vision doesn't become vision until it's written on paper. Because once it's on paper, you can see it. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying you've got to be able to see it with your eyes. You've got to be able to know what it is that you're called to and what you're going to do with your life. And it's important to understand that. And so Jesus tells us, he says, the difference between a dream and a vision is that you write the vision down. You say, here is the direction that I'm going to go. This is the direction that we're going to take. So what I want to do for the next few moments is I want to talk about seeing your future with faith rather than fear. Because what I am noticing is that a lot of people are living their lives in fear. They're afraid of what's going to happen financially. They're afraid about the future of our nation and of our churches and, and all these things. And people, I just see people living with fear. In fact, when I talk to people, all I hear is fear. God doesn't want us to live with fear. He wants us to live with faith. To believe that he has an incredible plan for our life, an incredible plan for our church, a credible plan for us as we begin to move towards the future individually. So today I want to tell you a story. It's a story that's found in Numbers chapter 13, I mean, I'm chapter 13 and 14. It's the story of God's people, the Israelites. And they had been in slavery for over 400 years. God's delivered them out of slavery. Now they're in the desert, and he's promised them a place that they're going to go to. It's called the promised land. And God tells them, he says, you're going to a place that's going to be your land. It's going to be something that you own. It's full of greatness. It's beautiful. Uh, it, it's flourishing in ways that you cannot imagine. And so here they are. They're standing on the edge, getting ready to go into the promised land. And, and Moses does something. He, he gathers together 12 spies. And he sends them into this land. And he says, I want you to see with your eyes what is there. And over the next 40 days, I want you to bring back a report to me about what you see. Now, in this story, what we're going to discover is that some of them had faith. And others of them had fear. I don't want you to live in fear. I want you to live with faith. Somebody asked me one time a question. They said, Pastor Marty, how much do you believe, uh, what, what, what percentage do you need to know that it's God for you to move in a certain direction? I said, 51%. Listen to me just for a moment. Let me tell you why 51. Because what I've learned in my life is that sometimes, there are times, and let me just tell you this, most of us, we function this way, we want to know 80 or 90%. Here's what I've learned. 51% is all I need. God, if, if it's 51% you, I'm going to do exactly what you asked me to do. Now, somebody asked me this question. They said, well, what if it wasn't God? I said, well, guess what? Now God knows that I'll obey and do whatever he asked me to do, and what I want is just to obey and be obedient, right? 51%, that's all I need. And so here they are, getting ready to go into this land, and some of them began to fear. They were, in fact, they were living in fear. 
So I want to just look at this story for a moment. I want us to pull out some truths that I think are important that we're going to learn from this story. And so if you will, just kind of follow along with me here for a second as we listen to what is written. It says, Moses gave these men instructions and he sent them out to explore the new land. It says, go northward through the the Negev into the hill country and see, notice the word there, see what the land is like and find out. So he's telling them to explore whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? So they're, they're exploring this idea, right? They're, they're trying to figure out, okay, what, what does this future look like that God is telling us that we're called to? And then he goes on and he says, it is, um, is it good or is it bad? Do their town have walls or are they unprotected? How's the soil? So, so how are we going to grow uh, crops when we get there? How are we going to be able to do that? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there many trees? Enter the land boldly and bring back samples of the crops that you see. So notice again, he's saying, look with your eyes. See the future and know what the future holds. And then he goes on. He says, and so they spied out the land all the way from the wilderness up to Hebron. And there they saw the um, Ammonites, the Sheshites, and the Talamites. The mosquito bites were probably there too. All families descended from Anak. And then notice what he says. He says, when they came to Ishkol, they cut down a cluster of grapes so large that it it took two of them to carry it back on a pole. They also took samples of pomegranates and figs. Now think about this. I, I was thinking about this the other day. This land was so rich that just one little clump of grapes had to be carried by two men. That's how big the grapes were. And I can't imagine that with my mind, but it just is giving us a picture of what it looks like. And then it goes on and it says, After seeing the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the people of Israel waiting at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. So what do they do? They come back and they're going to give a report. They're going to tell them specifically what was happening, what was going on. And you see, one of the things that we're going to learn as we begin to look into this story is we're going to learn that you can either look at the future with faith or you can look at the future with fear. It's important because so many of us don't look with faith. In fact, it says they reported the whole community what they had seen and they showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. So they say, okay, here's what's in the land. This is what it looks like. Here's the report about what the land is going to be like. And now we begin to notice some things, all right, as they begin the dialogue. The first thing that I want you to see is this. Anytime you and I act in fear, I overemphasize the negative in my life. That is exactly what's about to happen here in this story. They begin to overemphasize the negative. See, they've got fruits and crops that are in front of them that are massive. They've seen land that is plentiful and and, and is just prospering in ways they could not imagine. And so all of a sudden, they begin to overemphasize the negative in their report. In fact, listen to how it tells us this. It says... This was their report to Moses. We arrived in the land that you sent us to, to see. And it is indeed a magnificent country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is some of its fruit as proof. So what are they doing? They're giving him proof of what the land looks like. Notice this next verse. In fact, circle the word but, right? But, what does but mean? But negates everything that was in front of it. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a land that is prosperous. And so what happens is the people living there are powerful and their cities and towns are fortified and very large. And we also saw the Anakim, not the, not the Anakim that some of y'all are thinking about, Star Wars, right? We, we saw the Anakim's descendants and Anak, of, of Anak who are living there. And so they bring back this negative report. They begin to say, hey, man, look at all the negative things that that are going on there. You see, when you overemphasize the negative, it creates a lot more stress in your life. See, guys, let me tell you something. The reason some of you are stressed out is because you're focusing with fear and you're talking about the negative. And the reason that that happens is it begins to cause stress in your life. Let me tell you something about our students. A couple of weeks ago, a guy was telling me, He was with our students, and he said, do you know what one of the number one things our students are facing right now? I said, what's that? He said, anxiety. Anxiety from the hurricane, anxiety from COVID, anxiety from what they see going on in their home with their parents. There's anxiety. 
People are living in fear. And guys, God didn't call us to live in fear. God called us to live in faith. You see, two of the spies have faith, but the other ten did not have faith. They came back. The majority of the report was a negative report. And it's important that any time you live in fear, you understand that you overemphasize the negative when you look to the future. You're constantly talking about the negative. It's never going to be the same. It's never going to be the, the way it used to be. It's never going to, it's always negative, right? All you got to do is turn on the TV and you'll see a lot of negative. I mean, everything's bad, right? And the reality is God doesn't want us to live there. We can't live in fear. We have to live in faith. The second thing we learn is this. The second thing, I pay too much attention to what others are doing. You see, anytime you're acting out of fear, you're paying way more attention to what other people are doing. I pay attention to others. In fact, Numbers 13, verse 29, they immediately begin to talk about the beauty and the value of the land. But they immediately, uh, as they begin to share that, notice what is said. It say, they say this. They say, the Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan River. Now, here's what they were meaning by that. This is the point that they're, they're trying to make. They basically are saying this. They're saying it's a scarcity mentality. There are a lot of people there in the land. There's not room for us. I don't know if we are going to be able to do this. You see, you can't function with a scarcity mentality. Isn't it true that over this uh, last year in 2020, a lot of people lived with a scarcity mentality? I mean, they were living their lives with a scarcity mentality. There was panic buying during the pandemic. There were people running out and trying to grab up resources because they were afraid there was going to be nothing for the future. You see, it's important to understand if you look to the future with fear, you are going to what? Develop a scarcity mentality. You're always going to be afraid. And let me just tell you something. It's important to live with faith. Guys, I don't know what the future holds, but can I tell you this? I know who holds the future. And my faith is in him. My faith is not in the government of the United States of America or any other government for that fact. It's not even in a person. The only person that I'm trusting in is Jesus. You see, with vision, you don't have a scarcity mentality. You look towards the future with faith, believing that God has something great for your life. The third thing we learn is this. We also learn that when I live with a, a fear, I underestimate the abilities that God has given me. I underestimate the abilities that God has given me. You see, this is a trap that you fall into when you're looking to the future with fear instead of looking to the future with faith. I underestimate the abilities that God's given me. I think churches do this all the time. I think we say, hey, you know, we feel like God wants us to do this. And then we go, well, but you know what? We really don't have the financial resources. Or I'm not really sure we can, we, can, we can do this. Or maybe God's calling you to do something in your life. And you're thinking, man, I just don't know because I, I, I don't have those abilities. You see, don't underestimate the abilities that God's given you. And here's what I've, here's what I've learned. If God calls you to do something, he'll give you the resources you need to accomplish what he's calling you to do. He always does. And so whatever he's asking for you, the future of your life, he will give you the resources. He will give you the abilities. He will, he will, he will take care of you uh, with your talents and whatever it is that he's calling you to do. In fact, in Numbers 13, 31, listen to what they say. They say, but the men who had gone up with Caleb said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. You see, anytime you live in fear, the word can't comes up a lot. We can't do that. We can't accomplish this. We can't go there. Did you know that people are always saying, I can't, and people are always saying, I can? Both of them are right. Did you know that? When somebody says they can't, guess what? They're not going to. But when somebody says, I can, guess what? They're probably going to. You see, it's because what happens is they're, they're both right. Why? Because fear creates self-fulfilling prophecies. If you say you can't, you want, and you probably cannot. But with faith, if you say I can with God's help, guess what? You probably are going to accomplish everything he's called you to accomplish. You see, you're going to miss opportunities if you don't look with faith. You're going to say you can't if you're looking with fear rather than faith. 
This happened to Job. In fact, in Job chapter 3, verse 25, it says, What I have always feared has happened to me, and what I have dreaded has now come to be. Let me just ask you a very personal question. What are you setting yourself up for in this new season of life? What are you believing that God is going to do in your life? What are you setting yourself up for in your attitude? Your attitude about how you look at life and your attitude about how you're thinking about the future. How are you seeing yourself? Are you looking at your own abilities as inadequacies or maybe that you're incapable? Are you looking at your life with faith? Believing that if God is going to accomplish something, he will accomplish whatever it is that he has called you to do. In fact, let's go a little bit further. It says, they said the land that we explored devours those living in it. Notice the negativity there. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw giants there, and we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That is, as they looked at themselves, they saw their inabilities rather than their abilities. And remember this, guys. Let's go back over the last 400 years. What had God done with the people of Israel? I mean, he had provided for them. He had been there for him. He, I mean, he parted the Red Sea. They had seen him do mighty things. And here they are looking into this land that God's promised, and now they're doubting. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And we look the same to them is what they begin to say. And you see, it's exactly what happens when you're living your life in fear. I don't want you to live in fear. I want you to live in faith, to have the God's vision for the future of your life. So notice this, number four, the fourth thing that happens. I infect others with my negativity. I infect others with my negativity. You see, I'm not going to say a whole lot here. I am going to say this. Did you know that fear is contagious? Man, I've sat in rooms over this last year, and I've heard fear, and I've watched it just infect other people. It is contagious. And people just begin to talk, and as they get fearful on the inside, they begin to believe all kinds of stuff. And they think, you know what? Uh, our, our future is not great. But I want you to listen to what it says here in Numbers 13, verse 32. They spread a bad report about the land that they have explored. It's amazing. Two of them uh, came back with a good report. The other ten have got a bad report. And you know why? It's because it infected them. It, it, it infected the group. It just began to spread. You see, that's what happens when you become afraid. You start talking trash. You start talking negative. You start complaining. You start griping. And that is why the Bible tells us not to hang out with negative thinking people. Somebody today is going to go, I can't believe he just said that. Read the book of Proverbs. It says it over and over again. Who you hang out with is who you become. The people that you allow to influence you will influence the future of your life. I remember my coach in junior high school, he said it over and over again. He said, you are who you hang out with. You become the people that you're always around. And in my life, I just try to push those negative thinkers out. I want people who think about the future in a positive way, who are looking for the great things that God wants to accomplish and that God wants to do. And so he just says, man, be careful being around critics and complainers. Now, don't misunderstand me, guys. I have my critics, right? I have people that, that criticize all the time, and I try, to, I try to listen. I try to listen to what they say, but I also know this. I know that if, if what they say is not true, I dismiss it and just say, look, man, I don't need a bunch of critical people in my life. I need people that are looking to the future with faith. I need people that believe that God is going to accomplish what God said he is going to accomplish. And then the fifth trap, the last trap is this. I want you to write it down. It says, I make myself miserable. I make myself miserable. Misery loves company, doesn't it? You see, some of you are miserable right now. Let me tell you, you're miserable because you're living in fear. You don't have to live in fear. In chapter 14, verse 1, listen to what it says. It says, then all the people began weeping aloud, and they cried all night, and they grumbled and complained in a great chorus against their leaders. So notice, now they're blaming Moses, and they're blaming Aaron. You fools are the ones that brought us here. This is why we're in trouble. And they say, we wish we died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. They wailed. I mean, they're crying. Like, they, like let, just let that get into your head. They're crying. They're scared. They're having a full-blown full pity party at this moment, right? They're just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that this has happened to us. Now, this is very important because you can know that you're looking at life with the eyes of fear when the four warning lights go off that are here in this passage of Scripture. 
The first warning light is just simply this. Your sadness begins to increase. That's a warning light. If you're sad all the time, it's probably because you're living in fear. Now, there are other reasons for sadness, but it may be an indication that you're living in fear rather than living in faith. The second thing is this. Your complaining increases. It says they grumbled and they complained. I mean, I'm going to start fights at home today, okay? Ask, ask your spouse on the way home. Am I grumbling more lately and complaining? If so, that may be a warning light. It may be saying to you, hey, you know what? I might be living in fear rather than living with faith. The other thing is this. You start guessing your leaders. You start saying, you know what? It's their fault. I mean, if they were just preaching better messages and doing other things, you know, I wouldn't be living in fear. I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. But notice this, number four, you want to go backwards. Notice, they're wanting to go backwards. Let's let's just go back to slavery where we were in Egypt. That's how bad it had gotten. Now think about that just for a second. So here's what I'm saying today. You can live your life with fear or you can live your life with faith. You can believe God's vision for your future or you can believe what? You can believe another vision for the future that's not God's. So what's the antidote to this? We're going to talk about this more in the weeks ahead, but let me just kind of help you just a little bit. The antidote is just simply this. The antidote for this is that you have to develop a life vision of faith. Now, I'm going to show you how to do that in the weeks ahead, but you've got to develop a life vision of faith. You've got to begin to live your life in faith, believing that God is going to do exactly what God said he's going to do. In fact, did you know that Hebrews 3 verse 19, you can look this up later when you get home, It's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Listen to what it says. It says, so we see that they, the people who were the slaves that had been freed, they were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Do you know what God said to them? God said, your unbelief does not allow you to be able to enter the promised land. Guys, listen to me just for a moment. What in your life are you being held back from because of your unbelief? What in your life today are are, are you being held back from because of your unbelief? You see, God has a future for you. God has a plan for you. God has a vision for your life. But the very thing that might be holding you back is your unbelief. Your lack of faith and what God wants to do. In fact, I wrote this down. What blessing of God am I missing out on, me personally, because of my unbelief? Because I don't believe God. Because I'm not living with faith and trusting Him. And, and, and let me just tell you this. To me, hell would be if, I were, if, I, if God were to show me what He would have done in my life if I would have just believed Him a little bit more. I don't want to live my life in fear. I want to live my life with faith. So here's the starting point. This is what I want you to do this week. This series is going to be a starting point for you to develop God's vision for your life, for you to begin to understand where it is that God wants you to go and what it is that God wants you to do. We talked a little bit about that in the last series. In John chapter 3, Jesus said this, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Some of you can't see God's vision because you never have started following Jesus. And so what I want to encourage you to do today is to open your eyes spiritually so that you can begin to see with God's eyes the future and to understand the vision that he has for you. And so I want us to start this week by stop listening to your feelings and start looking not with fear, but start living in faith this week. Start saying to God, God, I believe you. If you say that this is what I need to do, I'm just trusting you and I'm believing you. Take a step of faith this week in your life. Trust God and believe him. Martha and Mary uh, and Lazarus in, in, in John chapter 11, verse 40. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. He said, didn't I tell you that you will see God's glory if you believe? Do you want to see God's glory in your life? Then you have to believe. You have to live in faith. And walk with him every day so that you can begin to experience the vision and the future that he has for your life. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. He knows the plans. But do you have faith 
to believe what he wants for your future. Let's pray together. As we pray, there are two prayers I'm going to pray today. The first one is for those of you that might be here today that maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Your spiritual eyes have to be open before you can begin to see God's vision. And today, I just want to tell you that right where you are, you can begin to believe. All you have to do is just believe that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. Put your faith and your trust in him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart. And so you could pray a prayer like this. You could just say to God, dear God, I believe that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my heart to open my eyes so that I might begin to live spiritually. And I pray that because you live inside of me, that God, you would help me to see the future with faith. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person here today who is a follower of Jesus. Would you help us to not live in fear, but God, would you help us to live in faith? Would you help us to understand that we were made for this? We were made for a life of faith, and God, you want us to live in faith. And I pray that in the days ahead, that we would do that, that we would act in faith, we would live in faith, we would believe in faith, we would trust in faith, and God, we would walk in faith. And by doing that, may you help us to see a vision for the future. And so, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And we pray this prayer. In the name of your son, Jesus, and all of God's people together said, amen and amen. Hey, I want to ask you to do something over these next five weeks. Uh, Five weeks from now, I'm going to be sharing a vision for the future and talking about where God's leading us as a church. Would you pray for me over these next five weeks and for our leadership team, our trustees, and our board as we're dialoguing and talking and thinking about the future, uh, and specifically that God would just give me uh, fresh eyes to share with you about the future of where God's leading us and what we believe God wants us to do as a church over these next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And um, we're excited about the future and we're excited about what God is getting ready to do. I love you guys. I love being able to pray for you. And I am praying this week that God gives you vision, that God allows you to act in faith and not to live in fear but to move towards the future believing that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. I'm going to ask our campus pastors if they would to come and to lead us as we close out today. Love you guys. God bless you.